So this morning I'm talking about respiratory physiology of deep diving and although I know the theme uh, of this day is, is to do with diver selection and fitness for diving, that kind of thing, this probably isn't right down that line, although there are one or two relevant points I will make about it, but I think I can assure you it's a fascinating topic. It's something that as medical people we're all a little bit familiar with, uh, and I think in terms of diving medicine, some of the perturbations of respiratory physiology that I'm going to mention are probably way more important in causation of accidents than we actually realise. I introduced myself in this way the other day, I know half of you probably have heard this, but I grew up in Wellington in New Zealand on a beautiful rocky coastline, that's why I'm a passionate diver, have been since I was a little kid and I'm sure I share that with some of you in this room. I, I, I used to go snorkelling across the road from our home and in Wellington, New Zealand you can still go and catch a crayfish, you know, 10 minutes drive from the centre of the capital city, it's awesome, it's absolutely awesome. I became a diving instructor as early as it was possible to do so at the age of 17 under the influence of some misleading advertising by Paddy. <laughs> and I, I know most of you have seen this, but uh, and I, I, maybe things have changed and there is someone from Paddy here today because I just want to complain that <laughs> it never really worked like that in my experience. But I went into the Navy after I did uh, medicine in order to learn diving medicine. It's like what a lot of us do. If it's the only place to really get some serious experience. And this is me here. I just want to point out, not, not here. Um, and I was part of the operational diving team. I was their doctor, and I had some marvellous adventures as, as part of that. And, and more latterly, I'm a technical diver, and I use rebreathers to explore deep shipwrecks and... Um, and other reefs and take photos, some of which you'll see. I just do want to point out I'm not a depth snob, uh, although I do talk a lot about deep diving. I've just had a dive which was absolutely world class, right up there in my rankings of dives that I've had in my life, and we never went below 12 metres, right? We never went below 12 metres. Awesome. So definitely not a depth snob. So what are we going to talk about today? I'm going to start with a little bit of basic uh, carbon dioxide physiology. That'll just be revision for you, I get that. Uh, and then, as part of that discussion, I'm going to talk a little bit about how work of breathing perturbs physiology of, of, of respiration, and particularly CO2 homeostasis. And so I'm going to point out the ways in which diving increases your work of breathing, because it does. And then I'll describe to you how the work of breathing increase in diving increases, tends to provoke CO2 retention. We'll talk about uh, the possibility that your ventilation can actually become limited during diving because of some of the physiological changes that occur. And then we'll fi finish up by talking about some of the things that we can control or manipulate in order to reduce these effects on us and the, the problems with safety that, are, that arise as a result. So that's kind of where we're going over the next 45 minutes. So let's start with a little bit of basic carbon dioxide physiology. And you all know this, carbon dioxide is a, uh, a product of metabolism. It's produced in the tissues in the citric acid cycle, as I'm sure you remember. Uh, it's eliminated by breathing. It's a volatile acid by virtue of its reaction with water to produce bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. And I think we all appreciate that too much of it is bad. It's a very tightly regulated substance in the body. And we, as medical people, we all know that if you have high levels of CO2, that creates a respiratory acidosis. But let's just reflect on that statement for a moment in, in the context of diving. Why is CO2 bad in diving? And the answer is for several reasons. First of all, CO2 has its own set of toxic symptoms. So if you get hypercapnic, you can develop shortness of breath, headache, confusion, anxiety, it can cause panic and ultimately if you get a high enough CO2 it will cause unconsciousness. But in addition to that, it can be synergistic with other diving problems. So CO2 is quite a narcotic gas and it's very synergistic with nitrogen in producing narcosis. And CO2 also promotes oxygen toxicity by causing cerebral vasodilation and increasing the dose of oxygen to the brain. So if these, are these are reasons that are of particular relevance to diving, why we don't want our CO2 to be high. So this is a very simple model of CO2 regulation in the body. 
It's produced in the tissues, diffuses into the venous blood, and it's removed by the alveoli. Not all of it's removed. And the key thing to understand, and this is a recurring theme throughout the rest of this presentation, so it's important. I know you all know this, by the way. I'm not trying to insult your intelligence here. Is that it's the amount of gas moving in and out of the lungs that determines how much CO2 is removed. And that, of course, is regulated. It's carefully regulated in order to keep CO2 at the correct level, which, depending on whether you think in millimetres of mercury or kilopascals, corresponds with these numbers here for the arterial CO2. That regulation is going on in every single one of us here as we sit in this room. We're just not thinking about it, right? And, and I'm sure you remember this kind of model from medical school that if your CO2 begins to increase because there's an increase in CO2 production for some reason, then that will be sensed by chemoreceptors in the brainstem, and that will drive an increase in ventilation, and that increase in ventilation will bring the arterial CO2 back down to normal. And of course, once it becomes normal, then that shuts off the increase in ventilation. That classic negative feedback loop is, as I say, going on in every single one of us right now. So if that's the case, if increased CO2 drives increased ventilation, then you would expect, if you did an experiment in which you made the CO2 rise, like the, the, the person had no choice but for the arterial CO2 to go up, and the way you do that is by getting them to rebreathe CO2, so just breathe around a circle circuit with no CO2 scrubber in it, the, you're rebreathing so much CO2 that your CO2 goes up. You would expect to get a response in ventilation like this, wouldn't you? As the arterial CO2 rises, the alveolar ventilation would increase. That's what you'd expect based on what I've just told you about the control system. The truth is, if you do that experiment with a large number of people, you don't always see that. In fact, it looks more like this. So this is, real, this is an old study from uh, the Naval Experimental Diving Unit in, in the United States, 1958, but physiology doesn't change. So this is arterial CO2 here. You probably can't read the numbers, but that's 30, 40, 50, 60 millimetres of mercury, so 40 is normal. And this is ventilation in litres per minute, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. And these... Lines here represent arbitrarily grouped subjects based on their response. If you think about it, what that really would have corresponded to would have been dots all over the place. But the key thing to, p to point out is that some subjects do look exactly like we would have predicted. As the CO2 goes up, they ventilate more. That's, that's what you'd expect. But look at this down here. There are some subjects, a substantial proportion, who have a much smaller response to CO2 as it rises. Are there any respiratory physicians in this room, by the way? Just so that I know I, whether I should be intimidated or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Well, I'm, I'm pleased about that. That's really good. <laughs> any other anaesthetists? No? Oh, yeah, we've got one. Okay. Very good. So, so the response, despite what you predict, the response, instead of looking like this, it's kind of more like this. And if you take 50 millimetres of mercury CO2 in the arterial blood, for example, the ventilation in this range of subjects tested here could be anything from 12 litres a minute to 50 litres a minute. What an incredible range of responses to something like this. And if, if you distill all that down and put it simply, some individuals will tolerate a rising arterial CO2 more than others, and they don't try as hard to ventilate it off. And that's part of normal physiology. Now, that tendency is probably bubbling away beneath the surface in a significant proportion of people in this room. You just don't see it because your, your respiratory system isn't challenged to the point where it would be unmasked. But let me give you an example in clinical medicine where it does. What about emphysema? We all learnt at medical school that there are blue bloaters and pink puffers, right? So 
If you get emphysema and your work of breathing rises and you're one of those people who likes to defend their CO2 vigorously, you become a pink puffer. But if you're one of those people who doesn't respond to CO2 so much, you let your CO2 rise, you get pulmonary hypertension, you get right heart failure, and you become a blue bloater. And it's that underlying tendency that underpins those classic presentations in emphysematic patients. And that's something you don't necessarily learn at medical school. So what I want to go on and say now is because I've just given you that example of a clinical non-diving situation where the work of breathing goes up, emphysema. If you get an increase in work of breathing, and especially if you combine it with exercise, then it can unmask this tendency to CO2 retention, even in young, fit, normal people, not emphysematics now. We're backing away from that. And this is where it starts to get interesting for divers because diving results in an increase in worker breathing. Every time you get in the water, breathing through an external... I'll talk, well, that's the next part of the talk. I'll talk about that. Diving increases worker breathing, and it often involves exercise. In fact, it almost always involves exercise. And you combine those two very potent stimuli for CO2 retention, especially if you're in that category of people who don't respond that much. And that's a comment that all of us might have cause to reflect upon in the next few weeks, unfortunately. <laughs> so having said that there are some divers or some people who don't respond to CO2 as much as others, that that can be unmasked by a work of breathing change, let's now go on and talk about how diving changes your work of breathing. This is a photo from the famous cod hole on Australia's Great Barrier Reef. My good diving friend Trevor Jackson on the right here, that's him, that's the potato cod there. Um, he does, he's been accused of looking a bit like a potato cod. But they're just amazing beasts, a bit like the raggy two sharks we saw this morning. We were that close to raggies this morning. Like Cecilia's got video of, you know, it's awesome, yeah, fantastic. They're not quite as big as that thing, but they're still pretty big. So there are three things that I'm going to talk about. There actually is quite a long list of things that increase work of breathing and diving, but I'm going to focus on a few of them. So the first is immersion effects. So when we're immersed in breathing from an underwater breathing apparatus, it's possible to have a situation, in fact it's common to have a situation, where the pressure of gas inside your airways is different to the water pressure surrounding your chest. So let me show you how that happens. So if you are breathing from an open circuit regulator, just like we were this morning, the regulator supplies you with air at the pressure at your mouth, here, exactly that pressure. And that means that's the pressure that's inside your airways in your lungs. But the pressure on the outside of the lungs is about 20 centimetres of water greater because they're slightly deeper. Do you see what I'm pointing out there? And, and so there's a relative negative pressure inside the airways. And that's called a negative static lung load. And that can also happen if you're on a rebreather. How many rebreather divers in the room? There weren't many the other day. There's oh yeah, you. Yeah, so it's still not many. But a rebreather has a, it's like breathing in and out of a bag. You're just breathing around a circle circuit, like an anaesthetic circuit. It's just breathing in and out of a bag through one way valve. So you're in, your airways are in continuity with this bag on your back. And it, if you're horizontal, it is about 20, 25 centimetres of water shallower than your lungs. So the, the pressure inside the airways is less than the water pressure surrounding your lungs. And that gives you a relatively negative pressure inside the airways or, an, or a negative static lung load. So why is that an issue? Well, a negative stat if you've got negative pressure anywhere, then anything that can fill that void will try to do so. So in your chest, if you've got negative pressure inside the airways and you've got a distensible circulation surrounding that area of negative pressure, then what happens is the lung circulation becomes congested with blood. The blood tries to fill the space. I'm not saying it bleeds, but it, it just the, the circulation is very distensible and it swells up. 
So you get a congested lung, which becomes stiffer, less compliant, and the work of breathing is greater. A positive static lung load, on the other hand, is a bit like providing CPAP. And the way you could encounter that is if you're horizontal with a rebreather and you had the counter lung on the front of your chest, so deeper than your lungs. And I'll come back to that because that can be a potential advantage, but front-mounted counter lungs on a rebreather are a pain because you like to keep your front area clear, whereas you don't really care what's going on on your back, it's behind you. So we don't use front-mounted counter lungs in very many circumstances. So that's static lung loads. The second way in which the work of breathing increases is an increase in equipment resistance. So if you put anything in your mouth and breathe through it, unless it's a purposely designed low resistance device, it will provide some kind of resistance. So if you breathe through scuba gear, that's going to increase the work of breathing. A rebreather will increase the work of breathing. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, it's an engineering thing. It's not really physiological, but you just need, we need to acknowledge it and tick it in the box to say that it's one of the causes. And finally, I want to talk in a little bit more detail about dense gas. As you probably know, whatever you breathe from underwater, it provides you with gas at the same pressure that surrounds you. So the deeper you go, the higher the pressure of the gas you're breathing, and therefore the denser the gas. So density increases in proportion to depth. The deeper you go, the denser the gas. And if you're breathing a dense gas, then it increases the resistance to flow through airways. It makes sense, doesn't it? It's like pumping something thicker through a pipe. It's, it's going to be harder. It'll require more work. So the resistance to flow through a tube has got a term for density. So it is in some way, just you know, forget about the... I, I kind of usually promise formula-free presentations, and it's only to show that there's a direct relationship between resistance and density. So this increases the work of breathing. And as I've already alluded to, the work of breathing, an increase in the work of breathing, can perturb the control of ventilation. And we'll come back to that in a second. This photo here was taken, uh, again, on a, on a trip on the Barrier Reef, one of the outer islands uh, uh, in the Coral Sea, uh, a place called Osprey Reef, the received wisdom is that there's nothing worth seeing on a coral reef below 30 metres because all the colour's gone and it's too deep and you don't get coral growth. So we were diving along this wall at 70 metres and we found this. And it's the most unbelievable, festooning, multifaceted, multicoloured coral, soft coral that I've ever seen in my life. It's unbelievable. And it starts at about 50 metres and continues down to about 80 metres. We can see, there's the bottom down there, it's about 80, 82, 83 metres. And you've got this beautiful wall just covered in this stuff. A, a few more photos of it will pop up from time to time. But the, this, so getting back to my point. Worker breathing can perturb control of ventilation. So if we go back to that model that we were looking at before, remember, increasing CO2 sensed in the brain drives increased ventilation. What I'm saying is that an increase in the work of breathing can turn this process off so you don't get a compensation or as much compensation for rising CO2 as you normally would. And in a situation like that, as you might imagine, CO2 may increase just because we don't breathe enough to get rid of the CO2 we're producing. So you retain CO2, just like a blue bloater with emphysema. They don't breathe enough to get rid of the CO2 they're producing, so the CO2 rises. And in fact, diving in some, there have been a few publications where diving's been referred to as instant emphysema for that reason. Now, and can I just make the point again that this tendency for worker breathing to perturb this process is variable amongst different people. So some people, it will do it more than others. Okay. So just to frame that another way, or to emphasise the point, and I apologise if I'm over-emphasising it, exercise 
and an increase in CO2 production when the worker breathing is normal will result in the brain driving an increase in breathing to keep CO2 normal. When your breathing is normal, in fact, if we all went for a run now, our CO2 would not go up because the worker breathing is normal and most people will keep a normal CO2 during exercise when there's no interference with respiration. In fact, CO2 can even go down during exercise. However, in contrast, if you, get, if you exercise and have an increase in CO2 production when the work of breathing is high for some reason, like in diving, then it's as though the brain has this choice that I was talking about before. It can go, well, okay, I, I think keeping the CO2 normal is important, so I'm going to drive that increased work. Or, in some people, the brain goes subcortically, you're not thinking about this, Oh no, I don't, I don't care about the CO2, I'm more interested in conserving energy. It's interesting to reflect upon why this happened at an evolutionary level, I don't, I don't know, but it, it has, and maybe it'll evolve out of us in time, but this is where we sit. Some people do this, and some people do this. And because diving increases work of breathing, we see it in diving. We see this, particularly in diving, high CO2. Oh yes. Um, this is actually, I, 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 upon reflection, this is a stupid photograph to show a South African audience because you probably don't care about these things, see them so often in diving. But this is one of my favourite photos of a great white shark. I didn't take it. It was taken by a Canadian friend of mine called David Fleetham who, who was leaning out of a shark cage in South Australia um, and they'd been baiting these sharks up. So they were a bit skittish. And he had a big wide-angle lens, fisheye lens he was taking the photos with and the shark came in very quickly and David sort of snapped the photo and tried to go back into the cage but the hood of his wetsuit caught on a bolt on the, uh, on the bar of the cage and he was kind of going like this trying to get in. And he says, when he talks about it, he says that he's lamented the fact ever since that he didn't have a large chunk of coal clenched between the cheeks of his buttocks because had he done so, he'd now be in possession of the world's largest diamond. Um, and I... I, I kind of can believe that, but just where we've been, we've had Barry Coleman showing us these photos of him swimming around in the wide open spaces with one of these things. Probably not one that's been stirred up too much, but uh, anyway. <laughs> puts it, oh, that's the dangerous end of the shark there, by the way. If you're, ever, if you're ever in the water with one of these, you need to know that. This is the non-dangerous end here. So here's another interesting problem. It's just setting aside for a moment, so this is a gear change, right? We're, we're kind of changing gear here. Setting aside that issue of respiratory control for the moment, another issue that arises is that in diving, we can sometimes see a limitation on the amount of ventilation that you can perform. So that's a little bit different to what I've been saying. What I'm saying here is that even if you try hard to ventilate, even if you do try, like consciously try, your ventilation can be limited. And let, let me describe that to you and why that can happen. I'm going to illustrate it with a story that some of you, perhaps many of you, are quite familiar with because it happened here. And this is a paper that, that uh, Franz and Jack and, and I wrote about this accident that occurred uh, 10 years ago in South Africa. Uh, do you know, how many people know the David Shaw story or have heard of it? Yeah, so lots, yeah. Oh, okay, so, well, that's kind of good because I don't have to go into it too much detail. The, the subject of this is a guy called David Shaw who was an Australian, um, a diver, not a particularly experienced diver, but a clever guy, a 747 training captain, uh, technophile, well-resourced. Uh, I never met him, but I spoke with him on the phone a few times, seemed like a nice guy and highly motivated to push diving forward. He, he had that, that self-perception that he, he could push things where perhaps other people couldn't because he was used to succeeding, you know, he was, he'd done very well in his career. And he ended up diving here in South Africa at this place. Um, I've got a very dry mouth, so I'm going to struggle with this, but is it, it's Bosman's hut. Bosman's hut. Trying to do it anyway, but... Um, 
So this is a, it's an amazing place. Now, I actually do have photos of it, which Franz kindly provided me with, but in the interest of keeping the talk relatively short, I haven't got them in here, but it's a big hole in the ground with a tiny, what looks like a tiny little pond with a bit of duckweed floating on top. It looks very nondescript, but underneath this is a tunnel that leads down into this vast chasm. Now, I don't know if any of you have noticed the scale here, but this thing bottoms out at 290 metres. This is vast. When I'm telling New Zealand colleagues about it, I illustrate it by putting Auckland Sky Tower, which is 300 metres tall, into it, and the, this tip of the spire only just pokes out the top. I mean, this is a seriously deep and vast cave. The story actually started about 10 years before David's dive uh, with a group of uh, university, South African university students, one of whom was named Deondrea. Their little group descended, and they, what they used to do was descend into the roof of this cavern, which is around 40 metres, I think. And on this particular dive, for some reason, Dion became unconscious. Nobody saw him become unconscious, and he sank to the bottom of the cave and obviously was never retrieved. Uh, despite some attempts with robots, I believe. Anyway, about 10 years later, along came David Shaw doing a dive in here, and he did a dive on his rebreather to 264 metres and completely by accident f found Dion Dre's body. Left a line attached to it so that they could find it again, returned from that dive, and that dive went okay. Um, it's notable that he wasn't trying to do any work on that dive. And uh, he, he survived that dive, and they formulated a plan to go and retrieve Dion's body. And the plan was that they, they, they came back to, to the cavern with a large team of people, and David was going to go down, follow the line to Dion's body, put him in a body bag. Um, Dion's body was surprisingly well preserved through a process of saponification. Not the pathologists know about this, but... He actually wasn't just a bag of bones, there was a body. He was going to put Dion in a body bag and, and then bring him up to about 200 metres where his shallowest support diver, shallow being a relative term in this situation, um, was going to take the body and the, he would be, Dion would be passed up a chain of divers and David would bring up the rear decompressing. Long story short, well it's actually quite a long story long, isn't it? But when the deepest support, so David made his dive, and when the deepest support diver arrived at 200 metres on his choreographed descent, he looked down, and the water's incredibly clear. He could see David's lights on the bottom, but they weren't moving, so something had gone wrong. And in fact, that individual, some of you may know him, Don Shirley, um, tried to swim down to David, but his rebreather wasn't really up to the task, it failed, and then he made a somewhat inadequate ascent and ended up having his life saved by Jack and, and Franz, um, he was treated at the site in a chamber that had been bought there by the police, I believe. That, yeah, the police maybe even, even be here. Yeah, so, that, so the police had a big role in saving Don's life as well. I think if that chamber hadn't have been there, that would have been curtains. Anyway, so the interesting thing about this is that David was wearing a camera and he'd filmed the sequence of events that led up to his own death. Um, the di his dive, for, for him, was about 21 minutes long. He, he died at 21 minutes. Um, and the other extraordinary thing was that when the police dived into the cavern and pulled the lines up uh, several days later, David's body came up. And even more extraordinarily, he had Deondrea attached to him in a tangle of lines. So in a bizarre turn of events he, oh you star, um, in a bizarre turn of events he kind of succeeded in his mission and that meant that the camera could be downloaded and I want to show you a couple of, um, a couple of segments of that video very briefly uh, which just illustrate a couple of the points I'm going to make. Can I ask you um, to not focus too much on what you see because what, it's what you hear, especially in the second segment that's more important. So um, this first segment is at 12 minutes 20 seconds run time and um, he's just arrived on the bottom and everything's okay at this point. Everything's kind of okay. However, if you listen really carefully, I don't know how good these speakers will be, but if you listen really carefully you can hear this low 
pitched, low frequency, low pitched sound, which is his breathing. It's sort of uh, 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 a bit like that. You have to listen carefully to hear it, though. Um, but this is really by way of contrast with the second video that I'll show you. But anyway, this, this is the first one. So that's Dion there. That's his knees. Yeah, so it's hard to hear. But the point really is, because you, you'll see the contrast, I'm going to show one more, Jack, but the contrast is with the n next one. So in this next video, what happened here was he, he couldn't actually manipulate Dion into the bag and he decided to give up on his task, which was a smart decision and a good decision. And he started to swim away from the site and got temporarily caught in a piece of line that, uh, that was actually attached to Dion. And then things started to go wrong, and, and you can hear him become progressively short of breath, which culminates around about this time in this very severe dyspnea. You can hear this hissing sound and bubbling. That's him attempting to manually flush fresh gas through his rebreather because he obviously perceives he has a carbon dioxide problem. But the main thing to listen for here are these coughing exhalations that he... It's not very pleasant, by the way, but he kind of starts... When he exhales, he kind of goes, ugh, 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 like that. So just have a listen for that. So did you hear the coughing exhalations? So I'll, I'll talk about the significance of that in just a moment. Just to remind you of the track we're on here, I'm talking to you about how some of the issues that occur in diving can limit your ventilation. The, no matter how hard you try, you can limit the amount of ventilation you can do. So this was almost certainly an effect of gas density and its effect on what we call dynamic airway compression. Who can remember dynamic airway compression from medical school? Can you remember that? I'll remind you, okay? So... Let me describe what happened here to you using a, a simple single alveolus model of the lung. So here, here's an alveolus, elastic balloon, a, a, an airway that can collapse, like a kind of, think of it as a rubber tube, and a cap over the end. And with the alveolus distended and a cap over the end, it's like measuring the static uh, recoil pressure of the lung. You'll have a pressure in here which is proportional to the elasticity of the alveolus, you know, like a balloon. If it's more stretched and it's more elastic, there'll be more pressure. And then if you take the cap off, what will happen is that the balloon will contract and gas will flow out along the airway. And it flows because the pressure here is higher than the pressure here. And a point I really want to make strongly, I know this is simple stuff, but it's a good way of breaking it down, is that the pressure falls as it flows out along the airway because of resistance to flow. And that, that happens in normal ventilation. That's, that's just part of normal physiology. The key point in terms of diving and in terms of what you just saw on those videos is that when you have a dense gas, that decline in pressure is much quicker. So the change in pressure, once again, is proportional to this, but it has a term for density. So the denser the gas, the faster this decline in pressure. So now what we're going to do is we'll put our single alveolus model inside a, a diaphragm and a chest wall. We'll just call it a musculoskeletal apparatus that can contract. I'm sure you remember that when you exhale normally, like you're all doing now, you just relax and the gas flows out. It's the elastic recoil pressure of the lung drives it out. But if you want to breathe hard, you actively exhale. So you contract your chest wall muscles and diaphragm. So 
in an active exhalation, these muscles contract, and that generates a pressure. Whoops, it generates a pressure in the pleura, which is additive to the pressure in the alveolus, and that drives the gas out even faster. However, if that gas is dense, I remind you that the pressure falls along this tube even faster. So is this ringing any bells, like from medical school, dynamic airway compression, Starling resistor, that classic thing we all learned about? Can you see what's going to happen if you're breathing a really dense gas and you're trying really hard to breathe out? You're going to have a high pressure here and a big decline in pressure as the gas flows out along the tube. So what you get is that classic Starling resistor effect where the airway actually collapses. Do you remember that? It's, it's part of normal physiology. We see it every time we do spirometry, in fact. I'll demonstrate it to you in a minute. But that's exactly what I think we were seeing in that video with David Shaw. And can I also bring you right back, remember I was talking about static lung loads and how you can have a negative static lung load? So you can have a negative pressure inside the airways compared to the surrounding water pressure? David Shaw was wearing a back-mounted counterlung, horizontal, so he would have had a negative static lung load. So if you've got a negative pressure in the airway, at the same time as all of this other stuff, it's going to make that sort of collapse even more likely. You can see that effect here in this diagram. Uh, forget about the, uh, over this side. But just These are flow volume loops. You've all seen these, right? It's just what we get when we do spirometry. So you do a forced exhalation, and the, um, the flow in litres per second rises up. So you're from total lung capacity, it rises up to peak flow, and then it declines down to residual volume as your airways get narrower. And this is the, what's called the effort-independent portion of the, of the flow volume route. Remember that? So th the point is that once you've got dynamic airway compression, it doesn't matter how hard you try, you can't increase the flow. You, you can try as hard as you like, but that just puts more pressure on the outside of the airway, so it doesn't make any difference. That is a flow volume loop for air at one atmosphere. This is a flow volume loop for air at 10 atmospheres, which is not actually that different to the gas density that David Shaw was breathing. So much lower peak flow and much lower flows at all, at all lung volumes. Here's the scary thing about this diagram. Reflect on this for a minute. This, this little loop here re represents tidal breathing, the flow with just normal, you know, before you, remember we're on a spirometer, you get them to do a few normal breaths, you just go, and they take a big breath, and then blow out through the spirometer. Can you see what's scary about this? How much difference is there between tidal breathing and the maximum flow you can achieve on an exhalation. Almost none. Air at one atmosphere, you've got a huge capacity to increase flow. But breathing air at this gas density, you can hardly do, what the point is, you can hardly breathe more than what you're breathing sitting here right now doing nothing, even if you want to. So what implications does that have for exercising and CO2 retention? It's scary, isn't it? You could find yourself in a situation where you're producing more CO2 than you're capable of e exhaling, even if you want to. And I think that's what we were seeing. When they did this experiment, it's in this paper, it's in this paper, they actually say, when we did this experiment, our subjects started to perform coughing exhalations to try and cough the gas out. It's exactly what we saw in that video with David. Exactly. And they were dry, no static lung load, no equipment resistance, which he had, all of those things. So that's, that is ideal. It might be even worse under the circumstances David found himself in. So it's not surprising then that just increasing the gas density, and this is, this is a graph that comes from work in a chamber with low resistance spirometry equipment, so no static lung loads, no, no equipment resistance, but this is your maximum ventilation as depth increases. And what we mean by depth is gas pressure, gas density. 
So you, you basically put a, a, a low pressure, a low resistance circuit in your mouth and you're told, I want you to breathe in and out as much as you can for a minute. So you <sighs> maximum voluntary ventilation. At the surface, it's about 200 litres a minute. Even by the time you get to 30 metres, you're capable of shifting half the gas that you're capable of shifting here now at the surface. Half. And it gets worse as you get deeper. Scary stuff. I reckon scary stuff. Now you might say, why did we evolve to develop a dumb problem like dynamic airway compression? Like, you know, surely evolution should have dealt with that problem. And, it, and it, because we all get it. I mean, I'll demonstrate it right now. Okay, I don't smoke. I'm pretty healthy. I'm reasonably fit. But you'll hear it. So, <sighs> you hear the wheezing. You hear that was dynamic airway compression. So, is that bad? The answer is no, because the flows I was generating there were so high that if I could go out and go for a pretty fast run now and move enough gas to keep my CO2 normal. Those flows that I just generated were really high. If I tried to do that, though, at 10 atmospheres breathing air or at 264 metres breathing what David Shaw was breathing, I wouldn't have got that gas out nearly as fast. Do you see my point? Dynamic airway compression is a big disadvantage in diving, but it's not a problem for us here because, especially healthy people, because you can move plenty of gas to do the things you'd normally want to do. So at low gas density, it only occurs at very high flow rates, and that allows plenty of ventilation to do exercise. But at very high gas density, it occurs at low flow rates, and that can limit ventilation. Here's the scary thing. I think David Shaw was in a spiral. He was generating CO2. He couldn't ventilate enough to get rid of it. The CO2 was driving him to try harder to breathe. And what was that doing? Just producing more CO2. So he was in the spiral where he, if you hear the whole thing, and there's a few people in here who have, you can hear it happening. You can hear the ventilation slowly ramping up and becoming flow limited because he gets this coughing thing happening. It's, pretty, it's quite harrowing to listen to, actually. So to summarise all of that, an increase in worker breathing impairs respiratory control and exercise makes that worse and that can lead to CO2 retention. This, this process is not because you can't ventilate it enough, it's because your brain chooses not to. But in rare circumstances, if you're breathing a very dense gas, you can have the Dave Shaw pathway where you get limited ventilation and that will cause CO2 retention. Does that paradigm make sense? Are you happy with that? I hope I've developed that well enough for you to get your head around it. Okay, so let's just spend the next five minutes or so talking about the things that we can fix. Uh, you know, what, what f out of that discussion, what falls out of it that we should be telling our divers that is important? Firstly, should they be changing their rebreather counter lungs? Well, it would be an advantage to have front mounted counter lungs, but the benefits haven't been clearly well enough established, and having front mounted counter lungs on a rebreather for deep diving is a real pain in the backside. And so, I mean, until the equipment manufacturers decide to fix that problem, that's probably not a piece of advice we can give anyway. We are talking to the equipment manufacturers about a way of having front mounted counter lungs that aren't so obtrusive. Equipment resistance is an issue that's largely for the equipment manufacturers as well, the engineers, but one of the things I do tell divers is that if you modify your equipment, you should be very careful. Don't modify your equipment in any way that might change the work of breathing. You need to be very careful. And obviously, obviously, have your equipment well maintained, you know, get your regulators serviced, make sure they're as low resistance as, poss as it's possible for them to be. A very important perspective, and if you, if you do have deep technical divers coming to you for medicals, one of the things you should say to them is, look, you have to understand a couple of things. When you start going to those depths, your capacity to exercise is severely limited. You should plan your dives accordingly. If you're diving in a current, use a scooter. Don't plan to swim the same distances over the bottom that you do when you're diving scuba air at 10 metres. You can't do it, and it's dangerous to try because you'll retain CO2, or you will likely retain CO2. 
A couple of things that we're interested in encouraging divers to do big time is one, control gas density. Have gas density as part of your dive planning, and I'll talk about that in a sec. And I'm going to ask the question and answer it for you. Is it useful to try and identify those people in a recreational or occupational medicine setting who are likely to be CO2 retainers during diving? So we'll just spend a couple of minutes talking about that. Um, I acknowledged on my title slide Gavin Anthony, who's an engineer at this organisation, Kinetic, in the UK. They're a testing house for underwater diving equipment. And, and we have been talking for years about this issue of gas density, and he made the point that they have a database of test dives that have taken place with a variety of different items of equipment, so the equipment's not standardised, and I must point out, this, this work was not designed to answer the question we're trying to answer here, but it's the best data we've got. But these dives also took place with a wide range of gas densities, and one of the failure criteria for a dive during their testing program, which takes place wet, doing standardised levels of exercise, so high pressure, dense gas, exercise, all those bad things. One of the criteria was that if the CO2, in tidal CO2, which is pretty much what your arterial CO2 is, if it exceeded 8.5 kilopascals or 64 millimetres of mercury, normal is, remember, 38 millimetres of mercury, if it exceeded that, that's a dive failure. So what Gavin did was he extracted all of the data on gas density and dive outcome and presented it like this. Now, it's not that difficult to interpret. What we've done here is we've stratified density 2 to 3 grams per litre. For, for your information, breathing air now at one atmosphere is about 1.3 grams per litre. That's what you're breathing now, one, about 1.3. 2 to 3, 3 to 4, 4 to 5, 5 to 6, 6 to 7. These are all the dives ta taking place at these densities. The grey is the, is the dives that were completed without failure. The dark grey are failures due to other reasons, like something went wrong with the equipment. And the black are dives that met the CO2 criteria for failure. And as you can see, four, four to five, five to six even, the proportion of dives failing due to end tidal CO2 being high stays roughly the same. But then you get over 6 grams per litre and there's this massive inflection and you've got almost half of your dives failing, 40% anyway, failing because of high CO2. So what this is telling us is that there's an inflection towards CO2 retention when the gas get density gets over 6 grams per litre. And that's the best data we have. We're, we're about to publish that. This, this is the proceedings of a scientific diving workshop that Gavin and I presented this data at uh, earlier this year, and, and Noah are about to publish this, so it will be available on the, on the web. So that's, that's the first thing, is encouraging divers to plan their gas densities. It's easy to calculate what your density is going to be at a particular depth, so they should do that, just like they plan what the PO2 is going to be and they plan what, how much narcosis the gas is going to give them. They should also be planning what the density is going to be. And then finally, should we be trying to identify people who are likely to retain CO2? And you remember this graph here? This is what you would expect in the normal population. If, if you make the CO2 increase by getting them to rebreathe CO2, then the ventilation should go up. And so you could say, well, obviously if we tested them and they, they look like that, they're okay. The trouble with this is we did exactly this as part of an experiment that I won't detail to you now. We had divers rebreathing CO2 in a, in a loop with absolutely no scrubber, and this is what we saw in their ventilation responses. Okay, This. So this is end tidal CO2, this is ventilation, and each one of these lines represents an individual diver. And, and the beginning of the line is their starting CO2 and the end of the line is their... Sorry, the beginning of the line is their starting CO2 and ventilation and the end of the line is their ending CO2 and ventilation. And all of them, the CO2 goes up, all of them, because they're rebreathing CO2. But look at what happens to the ventilation. 
Some of it goes up, some of it goes down, some of it stays the same. Now they were breathing through a rebreather, not a low resistance circuit, and a low resistance circuit might make the test a little bit more sensitive. But the point of it is, and that has been tried to, the point of it is that there's massive variability in this. So the problem with CO2 tolerance tests, and pretty much every Navy in the world has gone down this road at one point in time and they've all given it away. And the reason is a lot of people will fail them. Is that a problem? Well, it kind of is because you would rub out a lot. I mean, these kind of events that we see in diving that result from CO2, I'm not sure how common they are, but they're not that common. You'd rub out half your population on the basis of our data there. So many will fail them. It's difficult to know where to draw the line. I mean, there's no clear boundary between normal and abnormal. But most importantly of all, you get into this trouble and I'm sure any of you who do occupational medicine will understand this. If you have a young guy who's got his heart set on becoming a Navy diver, that's all he's ever wanted to do in his life, and you make him do a test where he will learn from other people who've done it that the key to passing the test is you have to breathe a lot, then they'll be going <laughs> like that from the moment they put the circuit in their mouth. It, it, it doesn't work. It, and you can't do it under an anaesthetic. I mean, that would be unethical. And also, an anaesthetic has a large effect on your breathing drive as well. So there's no easy answer to this. And I'm not aware of a single military in the world that is currently doing this as a selection criteria for their divers, because it just doesn't work. I mean, it's a great idea, but it, it doesn't work for these reasons. So pulling all this together, um, underwater breathing resistance uh, so underwater breathing apparatus resistance, the, the scuba gear, the rebreather, the static lung load and dense gas all increase the work of breathing in a dive. And divers tend to retain CO2 as the work of breathing increases. And that is worse in some people than others and it's exacerbated by exercise. Rebreather divers especially, but any diver, should be very wary of heavy exertion, or virtually any exercise that should say. Gas density calculations should be part of dive planning and CO2 tolerance tests are a waste of time. So that's where I'd like to end. Thank you very much. Franz. Yeah. Just for clarity, Simon, great presentation. Was the density uh, study only done on rebreathers? Or did it no, it involved both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so that makes it even more yes, it does. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's, that was open circuit and closed circuit dives. Which is kind of why I say it wasn't really designed to answer the question because it's, the equipment's hetero, heterogeneous. But, it, but it's still, there's a clear inflection there. And the failures yeah. didn't stratify for one system versus another. No, they didn't, no. That, we looked at that. Hmm. Yeah. I'm not sure when you got to the bottom, just hook. Was it not possible for them to place a hook on the, the once they put them in the body bag and leave them? Yeah, yeah, no, that's what he should have done. Um, it's, uh, I, think, I think the answer is he probably didn't think of it. You know, he, he, they had a plan. They'd been thinking of this plan for a long time, and he was, he was tunnel-visioned on this plan. And it, his thinking would have been significantly impaired. I mean, his CO2 would have been sky-high to drive that kind of ventilation that we saw. He, he wouldn't have been thinking straight. He was thinking straight enough to abandon it, I must say, but that was probably a clear-cut rule, line-in-the-sand thing as well. That the, but I think the body bag... A lot, of people have, a lot of people have asked that question. Why didn't he just... He could have just swum down there, hook, hooked a line on Dion, and swum away, and everything probably would have been all right because it was not much different to, to the dive he did previously. But when he started to work, started to pull on him and do stuff, he, was, he would have been right on that line. You know, I can just maintain my CO2 you know, with a relatively small amount of work. The minute his work increased a little bit, he just couldn't keep his CO2 normal anymore. Yeah. So it's a, Oh, it was, yeah. Oh, yeah, but if you think that divers get educated in this way, you, you know, <laughs> you're dreaming. It doesn't happen. And part of the problem is the instructors don't understand this stuff. You know, that doesn't get... Yeah. What's that? It was available on the day that Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, you weren't the only one. There was a guy last... A month ago... Guy Garman, an ENT surgeon, exactly the same as David Shaw. He had the same number of dives, 300 dives in his career. Who, and he, he was an ENT surgeon, clever, thought he was fantastic. 
just tried to break the 1,100 foot open circuit dive record and he got told you, his, his density at the bottom of his dive was 12 grams per litre 12 grams per litre <laughs> he's got a video too I haven't seen it yet I think I will yeah, tragic, terrible. How do you feel just before you die at, 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 at a time like that? <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know. So it's an interesting question. Unconscious. Um, I think I, I think that you'd go through a phase of being incredibly stressed, and then it would become more like an anaesthetic. Yeah. If you listen to to the tape right to the end, the breathing starts to settle down actually, <laughs> and you can hear him. It almost sounds like he's become unconscious and he breathes for a little while and then he, I think he loses his mouthpiece and you hear this kind of <coughs> like he's, he's got water and his cords have closed. But, yeah. Uh, hmm. Would a buddy have made a difference? Uh, it might have. It might have, but it could, in a scenario like that, it could easily have resulted in two deaths. The problem, the, the reason. That dive got defined as a solo dive almost entirely on the basis that he was the only one with a rebreather that was capable of going to that depth. It's the same rebreather I used for my 180 metre dive. In fact, his rebreather and mine were assembled next to each other on, a, on the same table, a Mark 15.5, a huge scrubber. Um, yeah. So he had the rebreather that could survive, no one else did. Don Shirley tried to get down there, his rebreather broke. Yeah. Anyway, look, I should stop because... Um.